Hola, chicas. Welcome to Encuentras Your Voice podcast, the vocal piece of Encuentras Media, to bring you all the hits and highlights of what is happening in the world of all things Latina. I'm your host, Consuelo Crosby, peruana, structural engineer, mother, and Scorpio Energy Latina, ready to hold the mic for you to share your valuable story of living in your authenticity and the success that it brings you. Join our sassy guests as they proudly share how it started, how it's going, and where they are headed to support and encourage the comunidad to amazing success. Your voice is powerful, and it's time we kick it up to maximum volume for everybody to hear. You want representation, then you have come to the perfect comfort zone. Relax into this and feel a major part of something big, bold, and beautiful. Coming to you every Wednesday, 5 p.m. California time, but available to you anywhere in the world because our Latinidad is global. Love having you here, so sit back now and join the fun. Hola, chicas. Welcome to your favorite podcast, Encuentras Your Voice, where we learn valuable life lessons from mujeres who share their journey of self-discovery and the success that followed. I'm your host, Consuelo Crosby, coming to you every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Time from San Francisco, California. We love that you have subscribed to this podcast and continue to champion women who understand the life of all things Latina. Today's guest goes way out to the stratospheric reaches of the universe for what she has been through to pursue her passionate dream as an international orchestral conductor, only to realize that it wasn't her dream alone, but for every person who felt left out, pushed out, unseen, allowed in, but never accepted. Jessica Bejarano is the founder and music director of the San Francisco Philharmonic, cover conductor with the San Francisco Symphony, curator and scholar in residence with the San Francisco Opera, and serves as board member of the Association of California Symphony Orchestras. She's performed in European concert halls, from Russia to Romania, Spain and Italy, and with Hall of Fame bands like Journey and legendary rapper Andre Nicotini. She is one of only 12 women worldwide accepted to conduct at the International Women's Conference in New York City, the first woman in history to guest conduct with the American Youth Symphony in Los Angeles, and ultimately leading her symphony to perform in the Tecate Alta Sinfonica, an emergence of classical music and urban Latino beats. And yet, with all this accolade, her main goal is to make classical music accessible and the norm for all people so they feel welcome with a sense of belonging. It's all about representation to Jessica. Yet even with her East L.A. verve, there were so many times she wanted to quit. After receiving a fellowship for the master's program at UC Davis, a program that only accepts one student a year, she was threatened to be removed because she didn't fit the profile of an orchestral conductor. To the point, the maestro told her, go back to your country you won't be a conductor here in mine. But that was the moment. Jessica realized that becoming a conductor was no longer about following her love of music and her dream to create it, but rather the need to demand representation of diversity in the privileged white male-dominated profession. And she never backed down. Instead, she stands strong in true authenticity. Tatted, queer, Latina from East L.A. who discovered classical music one day, the day that saved her life, 
and changed how we view orchestral conductors forever. Sit back, get comfy, grab some tissues, and make sure you have some room to get up and move because this one is going to take you for a ride. Welcome to Encuentras Your Voice podcast, Jessica. We are so honored and so excited for you to be here today and share your story with us. How are you doing today? I am doing absolutely great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's going to be great. It was such an honor to meet you and already be getting into a lot of the conversation that we know we want to share with all our listeners. So Why don't you go ahead and start off with uh, telling us about your heritage and what it was like for you growing up here in East L.A. Well, yes. So um, I am first generation Mexican-American. My mother and father are both from Mexico. My father from Tobasco, Mexico, way down south. And my mom from Tijuana, Mexico. Uh, I was born in San Diego, raised in East L.A., and eventually made my journey to this wonderful city of San Francisco. Um, And that's uh, my heritage in a nutshell. So you were born here in California. So grateful you stayed or came back, as everyone will find out, came back to California. What was it like for you growing up in L.A.? Growing up in East LA, you know, it's a, it, there's a lot of you know immigrant families there. It's predominantly Hispanic, very low income, not a lot of you know arts as far as the art that I'm in right now, which is like the symphony, the ballet, the opera. Like no one was you know talking about how they they have symphony tickets for the weekend. Like that was not part of any discussion or experience in East LA when I was there, it wasn't the safest neighborhood. You know, the high school that I went to, we were voted at the time um, as high statistic high school um, in highest top 10 in the country as highest um, uh, incarceration rate of high school students of teenage pregnancy uh, um, and murder. Like, uh, you know, like Mm. being murdered because there's just so much dang and violence in, in that community. Um, so if you were if you were able to get through high school and not be one of those statistics that drop out, uh, you know, a, a, a teenage pregnancy, incarceration or, or murdered, you're doing OK, you know, and that was like wow. the, the threshold, like the far. And I wanted more. I wanted more. And it's interesting because I I come from such a large Hispanic family. So there wasn't an expectation of you have to be successful or a doctor or a lawyer or a conductor. You know, it, it, it was just like, we just need to, you know, keep our head above water and survive. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that was the expectation. I left um, East LA. I ended up at the University of Wyoming. And Wyoming and East LA are <laughs> two very different places. <laughs> It's very, very <laughs> different, you know, um, on on so many different levels. Wyoming is very Republican. It's very Christian. It's very white. And I'm not those things. So um, one thing that I've learned that I'm still learning is like, no matter where you're at in life, there's so many things that you can learn from that experience and 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 take take away mm-hmm. from that experience, you know, and use it to your benefit. So, yeah, East LA was, was different. It was unique. Um, it was hard, but I think that that experience made me the tough, hardworking person that I am today. And you would have needed that when we hear the rest of your story, because coming from East L.A. and not having the exposure to the classical arts that you are in the center of right now, how did that transition even happen? How did you get into these classical arts? So after high school, I attended Pasadena City College um, in Pasadena, California, which is still there, like in SoCal. Um, And part of my scholarship um, as a a music ed major is I had to uh, play trumpet in three ensembles. So I did marching band because I did marching band in high school. I know that it's fun. Um, the second ensemble that I joined is wind ensemble, and I've been in a wind ensemble before, comfortable, fun. So I had to pick a third ensemble, and I was like, what should I pick? And there was orchestra. 
And my friend signed up for it. So I was like, I should sign this for it too. And I remember walking into that first rehearsal and, you know, it was this uh, interesting combination of like different string instruments and different woodwind instruments and different brass instruments, percussion. Uh, so it, it was uh, a musical environment I had never been in. I had never been in a symphony orchestra. I'd never listened to orchestral music. No, none of that. And we were rehearsing Beethoven Symphony Number no. Five, super classic, oh. mm-hmm. and Rafe Von Williams Dona Nobis Bachim, which also had singers. So they brought singers in at some point during the rehearsal. And I remember just holding my trumpet, like looking around and listening to everything that was happening and being, <laughs> this is awesome. This is great. This is an incredible combination of of instruments and 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 the incredible music and, and I I love this. This is like wow. And so after that rehearsal, I drove to Tower Records when it existed and <laughs> went to the classical music section and bought as many classical CDs as my arms could hold. And I went home that night. Rehearsal got out at 10 p.m. I went home after buying wow. all those CDs. And just stayed up all night listening to classical music. Um, And I was like, like in tears because I was so moved by the beauty of this music, but also shocked that I was 18 years old and this was the first time that I'm listening to it. It was always in me. It was just like that rehearsal and listening all night to classical music, that chip of that love, you know, and passion for that music was finally activated. And it was activated full force. I was just, at that point, I was in love. Like, th- this is for me. This is my music. Wow. Yeah, 18 years old. The first time you hear classical music, but you were born with it. And you're born to do what you're doing. And yet, did you find yourself Latina from East L.A. as one of the only ones going down this route in classical music? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and, and if I'm wrong, I would love to meet the other people that meet LA when I was there that were doing or, you know, that, that are doing the same thing that I'm doing or, or that fell in love with classical music. But yeah, it just, it, it wasn't a, a cultural experience or expectation. Um, you know, my mother, you know, had, um, a fourth grade education. She worked at Toys R Us. She worked at a little hamburger stand, flipping burgers and, she worked at a casino as a custodian, like back to back to back to back to support us. And so, you know, there was no extra money to go to any kind of concert, to any kind of music experience. And the music that we did have at home was the music that my mom loved, which was a lot of her Spanish music, a lot of her, you know, dancing, a lot of her salsa. And so I saw the love of music through my mom. But it was Spanish music and it was for her, it was singing and dancing. Um, but still, it was this wonderful, like really deep love um, of music that she had. That I think just transferred to me, but in the different genre, which is, you know, what I do now, which is opera and symphony. That is part of the cultura is that love of music. I think it sinks really down into your soul and it, it brings the joy out and how it brings the joy out. It, we're finding is very individual. Still loving this classical music at that moment. Did you think like, oh, I'm just going to take this as far as I can go? Or what, did, what were you thinking that had you keep seeking higher education in the field? Sometimes I wonder that myself. How did I get this far? How did I get here? You know, one of the things that I saw was my mom suffer. She didn't have an education. So she, she had the minimal jobs the hardworking jobs, the jobs where people are ungrateful towards her. And I saw her struggle to make minimum wage, take care of, you know, her little family, me, my brother and my sister. And I remember seeing her struggle so much and thinking that I I don't want that life for myself. Like, I don't want to not have an education and and, and have these minimal jobs. Like, I, I want to do something bigger and better to honor my mom's hard work, to honor her journey and to give back to her and to the name of our family. And so the best thing that I can do was to do what I love, which was music and to go to college for that. 
And, you know, I'd come from a very large, extensive Mexican family. There's about like 80 of us, oh, you know, and out of very large <laughs> family. And out of all of us, only four of us have gone into college. It's not a family expectation, but it's something that I innately wanted for myself and for my mother. I had this goal that one day, once I would graduate from college, get my degree and get a, you know, a, a nice thing job that I would like knock on her door and tell her today, you're going to quit your job because I'm going to take care of you for the rest of your life. Yes. You get to kick up your feet, put your hands behind your head and just relax. You know, and my success is her success. It was important for me to break the cycle of our family and do something different for her and for me. To honor her. Yeah, mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah, beautiful story. Beautiful. Between that and your innate strength, your, your strength from having gone through what you went through growing up, you chose to go into conducting specifically rather than be along in the musical areas, in, you know, as part of a symphony, as uh, being a musician, not many people would ever think of being a conductor. How did that come to be? Because that's a big leap from being around the music, being part of the music, but being the conductor, there's only one. And again, you are finding yourself as the only one. How did that come about? So I was off to college to become a music teacher. My degree was Bachelor of Music Education. So I was going to be a music teacher at a high school or at a college. Mm. So I already had this love of classical music from the earlier experience that I had. Um, I was in college, you know, on, on track to get my music education degree. And part of the degree requirements is that you have to take a, a course in conducting and in that course, all majors, whether you're going to be a choir director, a jazz ensemble director, a band director, an orchestra director, an opera, whatever, you are taught by a professional conductor on the art of conducting mm -hmm. and how to read a, properly read a score, how to run a rehearsal, how to inspire musicians, technique, gesture, so forth. So when I was taking that course, I fell in love with the art of conducting. I fell in love with it. And it was just this epiphany where I was just like, oh, I'm going to be a conductor. There it is. Boom. I'm going to graduate from the University of Wyoming. So I'm going to go to grad school for conducting. And I'm going to go down that path now. And I did not do the research as far as women in the field, um, the history of women in the field or the lack thereof. Lack I thereof. did not mm -hmm. do the research. I, I'm glad I didn't do the research because, you know, we're less than 30% of the population in this country. And I think it's worse in Europe. I will never forget the moment where I knew I wanted to become a conductor. It, I was on the second floor. The carpet was brown. The walls were a little off gray. They were made of brick. Like, I, think, I remember oh, it wow. so clearly. It was a moment. It was a, a, a life-changing moment where I made a decision very innocently and for the sake and just the love of music and, and, and wanting to do this, not knowing what was going to lie ahead in that pursuit. Mm. So you love the whole idea of creating the entire sound, the music, and we're more focused on that, that power from within you and bringing it out. But like you say, for anybody more familiar with the classical music, we know it to be a white, male-dominated, privileged place. So you say you having to apply for a master's in conducting and those two, you being brilliant, a Latina from L.A. against this white male dominated privilege, and yet you make it. You make it into the masters for conducting. And what do you find? So I graduate from the University of Wyoming. I get accepted to UC Davis um, for my master's in or orchestral and choral conducting and and they accept one student a year. So I was a student that was accepted into the program. And I had a, an orchestral professor and I had a choral professor. And the orchestral professor just, he was not a nice person. Um, mm. He was not welcoming. And he made the journey very, very difficult for me. 
And it wasn't even about tough love. Like I, I, I've experienced mm. tough love. I know what that is. This yeah. was not tough love. This is just like, you know, a horrible, horrible experience. And all I wanted was his pearls of wisdom, the, you know, the education and degree so I can move on and continue to do what I was so passionate about and, and, the, and what I was ultimately destined to do. But him and I would have weekly score study sessions in his office. And this one day he just stopped and he like rolled back in his chair and crossed his arms and He's like, are you serious? And I was like, serious about what? He's like, are you serious? And I was like, I'm sorry, about what? And he pointed at me from the top of my head down to my feet, back up. And he's like, are you serious about becoming a conductor? And I said, yes, absolutely. I'm dedicated. I'm passionate. I'm in. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I will do the work. Yes, I, I am serious. And then he proceeded to say, well, then go back to your country because it's not going to happen in mine. Get the F out of my oh. office. And I was shocked. I, 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 I it, it was shocking. It was it, it, extremely shocking. And, you know, I'm trying to grab my bag and my things and my oh. pencils are falling everywhere. And, you know, I, I, I just like instantly like, you know, left as quickly as I could and I didn't even go to the rest of my classes that day. Oh. I went home and I remember just staring at the wall and thinking, if this is how academia is going to treat me, where in academia, they're supposed to embrace you and nurture you and prepare you and educate you for the real world. If this is how academia is treating me, what is the real world going to treat me like? Like, do I really not belong? Like, should I just give up? Like, this is too hard. This is too abusive. This is... This is uh, this is stress painful. I, yeah, I, I, painful. I give up. Yeah. So for a split second, I said I give up. But then it, there was a voice in me that said, "No, no, 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 no. Do not let anyone take away your path, your 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 dreams. You know, your passion, your goals. They're yours, not his." And so I had to learn in that moment, you know, how to take a no and turn it into a yes. How to take a negative and turn it into a positive. How to use negative energy and use it to catapult me even further than I thought I could go. And so I, I learned resilience. I learned how to be incredibly resilient um, in the face of adversity. These situations that sometimes are, you know, negative, horrific, horrible, there is a way to find a silver lining in the experience and how to use that experience to make you a stronger person. It made me hungry for, mm. for this career, um, not just for the love of music, but now for the mm -hmm. sake of representation, yeah. you know? So it's not just about becoming a, a conductor and bringing the music alive. Yes, very, very important. But now there's something else that's in the mix and the, the, it's representation for me to stand strong on the podium in the concert hall, whether it's the symphony, the ballet, and the opera, and represent not only for future conductors, um, but for audience members as well, for musicians on the stage, for patrons, for board members, you know. And so my work has become bigger than I ever thought it was. You thought reaching head conductor, of which you are one, internationally known, would be the top goal. And then once you got there, it's like, oh, wait. Wait, I have even more presence, even more of a mission because you brilliantly made your way to becoming head conductor, to founding the San Francisco Philharmonic. Now, <laughs> after describing what you have so far, I don't know how you got the energy anymore. Or, or Yes, you're strong and yes, you're fiery. And the motivation of caring for your mother and all keeps you fueled. But now you're a head conductor and you still decide to go further with founding the San Francisco Philharmonic. What inspired that? Well, you know, I've always described my career as women against the tide. You know, it always felt like I, I was in that space, but I was an outlier. Like I was allowed you know but i wasn't really truly accepted so i wanted to create a space where being me 
looking like me, being a queer, Latina, tatted, comes from an impoverished family, can be in this space and and not be just like like a marker, you know, and a banner for DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but no, like really exist and belong and be accepted as just part of the environment. If you're a woman, and sorry to say, but, you know, if you're a woman that comes in with knowledge and passion and presence, that can be misconstrued as like, you know, she's a bitch, you know? Mm. And yeah. so, but, but if you come in a little too soft and a little too weak as a conductor, mm. then that horrible because you need to be a very strong leader. You're leading 75 people and inspiring them, you know? And so it's like, you're damned if you do. And if you're, and you're damned if you don't, where do I exist? You know, where can I be where, where it's okay for me to be me? And I was finding it very difficult to really find that orchestra, that community, that environment that would truly welcome me. I remember I did a conducting workshop in Europe, and I'm not going to say where in Europe, but they they uh, <laughs> truly accept 20 conductors from around the world. And it's usually a ton of men, you know, and a few women that are accepted. And even there in, in that environment, women are treated differently. We were at this workshop. It was 15 male conductors, five female conductors. And every morning we would conduct for the maestro in front of all the other conductors. And there was five female conductors. One of the female conductors, she would do the makeup and the hair and she would get all dressed up. And that's great. You know, she really loved to, to look her best. And when she stood up to conduct for the maestro, the maestro said to her in front of all of us, he said, oh, he was like, out of all the female conductors here, you are the most beautiful female conductor. So let me teach you and show you how to use your beauty to get the most out of the orchestra. And I remember just sitting there like, oh, my God, like, what about the rest <laughs> of us female conductors? Like, are we top liver because we're not the most beautiful one? And secondly, like, what does beauty have to do with, with yeah. using your beauty to extract music, the best out of the musicians? You know, like, I'm sure he has never told a male conductor, you have incredible pecs. Let me teach you how to use those pecs to get the most out of the orchestra. You know, so... so it's maybe they keep the beat. <laughs> maybe, you know, uh, kind of, it would be like a little flex. Yeah, you know? Know? flex, 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 flex. <laughs> so it's, it's these experiences. And that's just one. And I have many stories that, that, wow. that you know, have that. And so mm -hmm. I was done with it. So I was like, I'm going to create my own and it's going to be exactly what it should be. And so if you look at the SA Philharmonic, the board of directors are diverse. The musicians that you will see in the SF Philharmonic are diverse. The audience members that come into our concert hall are diverse. The conductor on the podium <laughs> is extremely diverse. So diversity and inclusion are incredibly important to me. Incredibly important. And it's not just a banner and a flag that we wave. It's something right. that we execute you know, every single day. That's what we do. Your strength is insane your your strength but your your self-love because there's so many moments along your journey to this point where a lot of us would have just scaled ourselves back in order to be accepted to find that comfort for everybody's well like okay we'll identify with you at that point tremendous tremendous because we do need you, your entire authentic self out there, front and center. Uh, this is something very epic. What has been the response to you starting this symphony? When I had the idea, I was flying back from Bulgaria. I was working at the, the Stars of Gorge State Opera House. I was the assistant conductor for a production there. And I was flying back from Bulgaria and, that, and on that plane, a uh, trip back to San Francisco, I had the idea of like being the founder of my own orchestra. And by the time I landed, I already had a little blueprint. I never founded anything, you know? So I was like, oh, I'm just going to start one. You know, bada bing, bada boom. Not realizing like, oh my God, this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I should be studying music, you know, 80, 90% of every single day. Mm -hmm. um, but being a founder... You know, like there's just so much work um, that, that needs to be done in order for the music to be rehearsed and, and created and performed by the musicians of the fill. And, you know, it's not a complaint. It's just a very yeah. obvious realization. 
I remember talking to one of my friends about the SFL and they're like, you created. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what? I'm a business owner? No, I just want to make music. I just want to make music. And they're like, you're the CEO too. And I was like, I do have that title. They're like, yeah. I found this, founded the orchestra at the end of 2019. As of this month, we are now four years strong. Um, and to create an orchestra through a pandemic and be like this successful, it's just like hats off to my team, hats off to the musicians of the SF Bill and hats off to the patrons like yourself that, that come and support us because it literally, it's not just me. You know, I had the idea and I threw it out and it takes the community to really embrace it. Yes. Yes. But forever grateful that you have this fire and this inspiration just fueling endlessly mm-hmm. in you. And congratulations to you to even thank you. To, to even think like, no problem. No problem. You're an entrepreneur. This is something that hasn't been done in the way that you're doing it. And it is very unique. This is a major city, San Francisco, saturated with symphonies all around for hundreds of years. And yet, never one like yours. You bring something very special, such a blessing that we have you here. Um, In talking with you, I discovered something I didn't even know about. It was the El Ultimo Sueño de Fría y Diego opera. I was shocked that something so large and so culturally deep and soulful was an opera. Can you speak to that? So I am one of the scholars in residence for the San Francisco Opera. So I get assigned operas um, and I write the pre-opera lectures and I deliver the lecture an hour before the opera. El último sueño de Frida y Diego, um, which is interesting because this last year was um, the 100th year anniversary of the San Francisco Opera. And then this opera was composed by a Peruvian, Lithuanian, Chinese composer by the name of Gabriela Lina Frank. Um, And when I was delivering this lecture, this opera, it was a Spanish language opera and it was composed by by a a, a female. Mm -hmm. That opera was the first time in the SF opera's history, the first time, 100 years, that one, that they performed a, uh, an opera in Spanish, the first opera spoken in Spanish on stage yeah. in a hundred years yeah. history. And the second historical thing about this opera was it was the first time they performed an opera by a female composer. Are you, you know? kidding? No. Oh. You know, and so the audience uh, oh, he's like, yeah, you know, that is great. I was like, yeah, it's great. But is it really... That it took them a hundred years <laughs> yes. to put a, you know, the Spanish language on stage and a, a female composer. But you know what? I mean, I love the SF opera. I know we're it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful institution. It's not about like when it happens, but the fact that it's happening now. And they're doing a lot of that now. And I'm very, very proud of the SF opera and how they're really bringing in diversity. And not just on the stage, but with the composer and their scholar in residence, me, this little girl from East LA is now like, you know, scholar in residence with one of the leading opera houses in, in the world. The younger generation, the generations coming up now in their 30s, 20s, teens, they're hungry for what you have to offer. They don't identify with anything that's the establishment, I should say. Do you think? Mm-hmm. I, I I agree. I mean, there. Yeah, it's 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 the it's a different mentality. This art form is deeply rooted in tradition. Tradition is very important. So tradition can be a good thing. It can also be a bad thing. And I think if this art form is going to survive, we need to make it for everyone. On every corner of that room, from the musicians on stage again to the board that runs it, to the audience members that come in, to the conductor um, that is directing the performance so powerful yeah Yeah, powerful are you seeing a new young um diverse composers and musicians and the entire industry coming forward now 
Yes. I mean, especially here in San Francisco, there is a conservatory of music. So there's a whole school of, you know, young composers. San Francisco State has a school of composition as well. So there's young composers coming through there. So there's a lot of hungry, you know, uh, you know, young, you know, energetic um our artistic minds that are coming through San Francisco. And, and I, I would assume that's the same for like major, major cities like LA and New York, Chicago, Boston, you know, Esa Becca Solinian, the mm. newest director of the San Francisco Symphony. Um, he is very, very big on composing new works and, and being a champion of new works. So he does a lot of that. So, you know, you can go to the symphony and it's not just 18th, 19th century composers, but he always has at least one contemporary composer on the program. So yeah, there, there's a lot of that that's happening around here for sure. For sure. How would you get younger people into the concert halls, into the performances to support and start shifting, changing, taking space in those places? So what we personally do as far as, you know, the, the diversity is we don't like put on a concert and like hope diversity is just going to magically walk into the concert hall we go do the late work like i you know have so many different relationships with so many different schools and a lot of these schools are lower income schools or you know schools that don't have a music program or the best music program so i go find mm-hmm. these schools i find the music teachers i find the, the principals and i send them you know an introduction of who we are what we are and i offer them complimentary tickets and or very oh, wow. very discounted tickets you know to get them mm-hmm. in you know, I work with the Mexican consulate and they help mark our concerts to get the, you know, the Hispanic community in there as well. Lipstick lesbians. It's, it's like a social organization where they love run it. different events around the city. Mm. I know the yeah. name is horrible, Lipstick Lesbians. No, I love but, it. I know it's, it's okay. We but, love the uh, lips. We love the lipsticks. There we go. <laughs> uh, but the founder of that organization, um, I, you know, I work very closely with her and she uh, helps promote our concerts as well. So again, it's like finding, you know, these different communities and establishing a, a relationship with them so that they promote what you do um, and have people come to your concerts. Every time you answer a question, it's just like your work level goes three times higher. <laughs> it's just like, I know we're, I feel the stress. I feel yeah, the stress. I'm so sorry. And we're trying, we, we have got to make this life easier for you because we will, we know your brain has not stop thinking and creating and envisioning something completely different and new. You want to let us in on what some of those dreams are? Well, I mean, for me, it's just to continue to fortify the San Francisco Philharmonic as an established San Francisco orchestra. And one of the things that's going to help solidify the future of the the Philharmonic in the city is funding. We need a lot of help with funding. When I first founded this orchestra, I paid for everything out of my own pocket, you know. Oh my gosh. And we're talking about the rental of the rehearsal space and insurance, the rental of the performance space. And that insurance, paying for the printing of the music, paying for the rental of percussion, paying for, you know, key ringers in the orchestra, paying for transportation. We're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars on a concert. We've had a few grants that keep us our heads above water, Mm. but we don't want to exist with our heads above water. We want to really secure the financial future of this orchestra so that we can continue to focus on the music and not about finding funding just to get by. But one of the other things that I want to do um, that hasn't been made quite public yet um, but I think what we're going to do is we're going to build uh, the San Francisco Philharmonic Youth Orchestra and just have this stellar, stellar, full on youth orchestra here in San Francisco. That's an extension of the fill that is taught by, you know, the principal players of the San Francisco Philharmonic. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that coach the kids. Yeah. That conduct and lead the rehearsals and performances of this youth orchestra. Sitting in an orchestra and having that experience is incredibly important for them. And, and it's not to prime them and prepare them to become professional mm-hmm. musicians. It's because that experience in itself, yes, gives them the music, but it also teaches them responsibility. It teaches them teamwork. It teaches Team them up. organization. It teaches them, you know, community. It teaches them about music. It teaches them so many different things that will help 
in their development as they become mm-hmm. young adults that go out into the world. And so I want to start one of those. Okay, can... all the Latina listeners right now are going, girl, we are going to get that admin done for you. There are virtual <laughs> platforms. We're going to set it all up for you. Okay, bring the help, ladies. Bring the help because that is, yeah, that is not your time. If everything else were to disappear one moment, I do not see you getting a job in admin ever. <laughs> no. You'd be great at it. I don't see it. <laughs> What about outside of the immediate industry? I know it's a hundred percent, almost a hundred percent of you right now, the classical music and creating and introducing, inviting people into this beautiful world you've created. But what about outside of that? What is a personal dream? Oh, hmm. I feel you know, I just I don't really think so much about me because I love what I do that I that it fulfills me or like already, you know, just to be able to do what I do. I mean, outside of music, like what, what do I want? Uh, that's a great question. I've never thought about that. I, I just work, 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 work all the time. But that's a great question. I do love to travel. I love, you know, exploring the culinary arts. Before the pandemic, what I would do is I would work in Europe. I had an orchestra in Spain and then the opera in Bulgaria. Oh, wow. And so I would spend three months of, of, of my life there working and or traveling and then nine months out of the year here in San Francisco working with these orchestras um but it would be nice to to travel without worry of work on top of that mm-hmm. but again mm-hmm. th- like I feel bad saying that without the worry of work because I love my work like it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of saying like I want to go on a vacation without my baby it's like <laughs> no like of course I'm gonna bring my baby with me I did it all the time don't let you know <laughs> you are a huge giver and giving to your mother and giving to your family and giving to the community, generations to come, uh, worldwide. And uh, interesting turning, turning that around, giving to yourself. What would that be? We'll have to catch that on your sequel. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to think about that. Well, we'll that's awesome. About that. Yeah, that's awesome. So you and I... Met in person. I made it a point. I stalked you. I did. To meet in person because you were having your first fundraiser recently in January here in San Francisco. Really, really intrigued with just who is this woman that walks into San Francisco and starts a symphony. And because of that, I get to join you on stage and do a little guest conducting that you already led me through lessons on. And it's blowing my mind and getting me really excited at the same time. Coming up in the performance on March 2nd at 7.30 here in San Francisco, we have sent out a blast for people to buy their tickets before it sells out. Have you ever done this before? No, not with the SFL. The SFL has not had a guest conductor since the founding of it. So we're excited to have you come in and and conduct them. And they're a great group of musicians and very exciting and they're going to do great. But no, going into any performance, there's always a little bit of of nervousness, a little bit. But Mm -hmm. I like that because it keeps Mm -hmm. me on my toes. I think if I were like extremely cocky and be like, it's as good as it's going to get, we're perfect and we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. I would be lying to myself and setting myself and the musicians up for failure. You know, as a conductor, it's not about you. It's about the composer for a song and doing that composer justice by bringing their artwork to light. And then also your musicians, you know, like setting them up for success and creating an experience um, that's going to be memorable for them, that's going to be educational for them. And one that they're excited to come back and and do Mm -hmm. over, over and over again with you, you know. When you're a leader, you're afraid and you're on the podium, they're going to know it. You're a leader on the podium and you're cocky, they're going to know it. You're a leader on the podium and you come in unprepared, they're going to know it. If you come in as a leader and you care, genuinely care, they're going to know it. You know, so I I try to be very mindful of the energy that I want of my musicians. Wow. Okay, that's going to be your quote for the episode because the whole time you're talking about this, I'm thinking... This applies to every single position of leadership, regardless. And it, it's such a great visual. It's, it's more of a visual when you're presenting it as a conductor to an orchestra, because at least we have knowledge of what that does. 
and and the difference between the conductors and and the sound that comes from being different and you can see the direct tie to the influence immediately and maybe even sometimes spontaneously with people when you have that energy of wanting the best for them and for you as a whole it's awesome. absolutely yeah it's beautiful um, thank you this episode is going to launch right before the um, the performance on March 2nd. So this will drop February 28th, right before, the Wednesday before the performance. And in this, both audio and video, it will be on YouTube. So we will have the information of buying tickets. It will be linked in the show notes. We will have the poster will be part of the YouTube video that will stay up there so they can always come back to because this isn't the one and only performance yep. it's the one and it's only performance a- with me but it's true <laughs> it's it's your debut it's your debut <laughs> but there's there's more opportunities for people to participate and be in the audience to see this magnificent philharmonic that you've created so yes what is the best way for the listeners in either in the immediate area or extended area to support you, to support you, your vision, and the San Francisco Philharmonic. Two ways to best support us is to attend our concerts. Uh, so if you go to sfcell.org, you can see all of our upcoming concerts. Um, and the second way is to donate whatever you can. You know, every little bit does count. It does matter. And you can do that as well um, on our website, sfcell.org. Uh, we are a 501c3. We have an EIN. So those are the two best ways to help us as of now is attend our concert or donate to our cause, to our mission. Beautiful. Absolutely. We'll get that out there. You're going to have a tremendous year again, starting off. And yeah, we can't wait to see where you go with this. But also giving back to yourself. I, I want some longevity for you to be able to keep doing what you're doing. So I think we need to give you opportunity for some self-care, self-love, put your feet up. Don't worry about anything for it. Nothing. Thank That's you. what we want for you. Uh, do you have any shout outs for your favorite cafecito place? Favorite shout out would probably be, I love to go to the Wooden Spoon in San Francisco for a great brunch. And then also there's a wonderful Mexican restaurant that supports the Estheful Harmonic here in San Francisco known as Santeria, which is a margarita mezcal bar, but also a lovely Mexican restaurant. They are supporters of the Estheful and donate whatever they can. And then, of course, the Pilsner Inn bar, which is a, a gay bar that has been around for 44 years in the Castro. Mm. Um, and they are also supporters of the Estheful. They have supported us since day one at our inaugural performance. So... These three institutions are very supportive of the work that we do um, and help um, in any way that they can. Oh, that's so shout cool. Out, shout out to them. We will honor their establishments as well to keep it going for everybody. Spread the wealth. That brings up uh, one more idea is some kind of sponsorship. Is there a sponsorship opportunities for the concerts, for the program, for... Yes, um, if anyone wants to help sponsor... We have, you know, the, the cost of, of the rehearsal space, the, the Can Bar Performing Arts Center. So if someone wants to sponsor that, that would be amazing. Uh, if someone wants to sponsor, you know, the, the cost of the performance space, the Hertz Theater, that would be a major sponsorship that, that would really alleviate so much of the operational cost. Um, and then also sponsorship of the musicians, because, you know, a lot of these musicians are paid. So if we can you know, if someone wants to sponsor, you know, the concert master or the principal cellist or the principal oboist or the music director. Those are different sponsorship that are different ranks, depending on, on the position within the orchestra. And all that communication can be done through your website. Yes, sfl.org. Or you can email us at hello at sfl.org. Perfect. Okay. We're going to get this rolling. It's going to go big. Keep your energy. It's going to go big. Wow. So much gratitude. Uh, You're an amazing person. Truly amazing. You're strong. You're beautiful. You're intentional. You're so compassionate for the community. So important. We are blessed that you landed here in San Francisco and didn't, didn't stay in Wyoming. Did not stay in Davis. 
But we want to keep you here. It's a little greed we have. We want to keep you here and we will do whatever it takes uh, Thank to you. keep you happy here until you're ready to move on. This, Thank is, you, my, this is my forever home. I, I want to stay here. So I, I will travel, but this is home. I, I fall in love with the city. Uh, this, this is it for me. So yeah, thank you so much for having me here and for being supportive. Like I said earlier, it takes a village, it takes a community. And so what you're doing for us, is, it's very meaningful. So thank you on behalf of me and the SFO Harmonics. Lovely, lovely, beautiful. Thank you. And March 2nd, everybody, March 2nd, 730, Herbst Theater, San Francisco, two Latinas on stage, major city, major orchestra. You're going to be the first one. Iconic. Iconic. We're going to get it out. Wonderful. I already, I, I already sent it out to the Chronicle and the East Bay Times. I'm like, come on, show the love. <laughs> good, 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 good. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I love doing this kind of stuff. It's important to spread the word, you know, just not just about concerts, but who we are and what I do and what we do. So thank you for, for the platform. Jessica Bejarano, founder, conductor, music director of the San Francisco Philharmonic. What did you think? Did that not give you all the feels? You may have felt angry, disheartened put off by what Jessica went through. But when you listen to her strength, compassion, and love of creating music for all people, I hope your soul turned to championing her to ensure her vision lasts for generations. That's our role. As a comunidad, we need to support each other if we want to be seen and live in a world of knowing. A world where opportunity is endless and life dreams do come true. It's like she said, she was allowed into these spaces, but never accepted. And chill, she made her own. So that's got to resonate with a lot of you out there. Jessica shared all the ways that you can support the San Francisco Philharmonic so that representation and diversity runs strong. And our youth can see themselves in the audience, in the symphony, and epically on the podium one day. So please do your best in contributing to the San Francisco Philharmonic in any way that feels good to you. Spread the word throughout the comunidad and introduce the music into your chill playlist, putting your little ones to sleep, or soothing your mommy after a long day. All that information is in the show notes of today's episode. So go ahead, click through, find San Francisco Philharmonics, send her an email at hello at sfphil.org. That's S-F-P-H-I-L dot org. And join us next week for our 15-minute pod club episode of today as we do the deep dive into the amazing life gems that you heard here today. From Jessica Bejarano. Now she's stepping into her truth, ladies. Ciao. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the Encuentros Your Voice podcast so you don't miss a single episode. They will automatically drop into your listening device each week. And we'd really, really appreciate if you take a moment to add to the reviews that we already have. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you're hoping to hear. And we will get there. Share this with your friends and family to help us grow our comunidad and keep following us on our social media. Tu Encuentras Your Voice. We are so grateful to you for helping us grow this community and would love to learn of all the amazing Latinas who you know are creating the world we thrive in. So reach out to me on social media at Encuentras Your Voice and let's keep leaning into our authenticity in pride. Help us make Encuentras Your Voice the place where you are 100% represented.